right, got them landed. When you handle these tarpons, see I'm using my shirt right there, their mouths are like... Baby tarpon 101. Beautiful fish. Take a look at that black and purple fly in there. Awesome. That is so. All right. Got that tarpon. So I'm going to give you some tips. Let him go. So I'm going to give you some tips on tarpon fishing and how to hopefully be successful on your next or first tarpon fishing. Say you're planning a trip to a beautiful location like this, you're ready to catch some tarpon, you want to be prepared with as much information in advance. I got a short video today, with a little bit of fishing mixed in, just helping you get started right with tarpon fishing. I've been fortunate enough to fish tarpon from Costa Rica to Belize to Mexico many times and Cuba as well. Tarpon have a huge range. You can catch them on the ocean open side, you can catch them in the beautiful Florida Keys or the Everglades, or we can be tucked back into a mangrove lagoon and be fishing these little lagoons and small channels like I am today. Chances are if you're watching this video, you want to have some tarpon action, you're probably going to start by spending most of your time fishing for baby tarpon. They tend to be quite aggressive. Uh, they that you get opportunities in greater numbers than you do big, large migratory tarpon out in open water. So we're here today fishing in these mangrove lagoons. When you're tarpon fishing, one thing that you want to know right off the bat, in case you're wondering, is we're going to do our tarpon fishing from a boat. It would be very rare to ever uh, fish for tarpon. The bottom and the substrate in most of this tarpon habitat is going to be quite soft. So we're not able to walk and it's going to be uh, typically too deep and and impractical to fish them on foot. So we're gonna be in a skiff or a panga boat like we are today with a guide on the polling deck who has his eyes in the sky talking you in to these fish. So as far as strategy goes, we're working our way through these lagoons and we're looking for these tarpon right along the edge. Go ahead and let's show them over here where we're looking. So those tarpon are gonna be most often cruising right along the edges of the mangroves. Oftentimes they'll be living so close within the mangroves, we can't even make a cast to get in there. So be prepared for a marksmanship challenge and be prepared to, to be challenged with the idea of flipping your fly or skipping your fly right up underneath those mangroves. All right, so we're gonna talk tackle. For 
we're baby tarpon now. So as far as tackle goes, these fish can be caught on anything from an eight weight to as heavy a rod as you want to throw. My personal preference is to throw something in the nine or 10 weight range. We're using heavy leaders. Uh, sometimes we need to really be forceful with these fish, both on the hook set, which we'll talk about later, but you're also gonna hang your fly up in the mangrove sometimes too. And with these heavy lines, I've seen a lot of rods break in that eight weight range, and I really strongly encourage you to focus on buying just saltwater specific rods. Um, I've used lots of different rods. I like lots of different rods. I happen to be using a 10 weight NRX plus uh, saltwater rod here. Today, um, a good sturdy reel. Baby tarpon aren't gonna make big long runs. Um, they're gonna jump like crazy. They're gonna pull and bulldog. Uh, but frankly, they're not a big running species like a permit or a jack creval or a rooster fish or fish that have open ocean uh, and a lot of speed to work with. These tarpon don't ever get a lot of momentum here. They just jump like crazy. It's great, but a good sturdy reel is nice to have just because it's going to last a long time. So um, I happen to be using a T-bore with a tarpon engraved on the side, which is pretty cool. As far as your leader system goes, there, there are lots of pre-tied tarpon leaders with different types of knots. Uh, in, in the Florida Keys, for instance, um, most of the anglers are going to use like a 20-pound class leader that's got different sections. Uh, that way they don't have, those tarpon have more room to run. They're going to make big, long, long runs. And those tarpon can be extremely large. Being able to break that fish off if you need to with a threat of sharks is important. And then if you have a malfunction with your gear, with that much line out there, you need that, that line to have a breaking point somewhere. And hopefully that breaking point is weaker than your backing so that you don't break your backing and lose the whole fly line, for instance. So that's that situation. Frankly, in these mangroves, we're not worried about you know fishing IGFA type leaders. Uh, I'm just running a straight 60 pound uh, fluorocarbon leader. And uh, I like to have mine just a little over six feet long. I think you want it under about seven or eight feet long. That way, when you're getting the fish close to the boat, a lot of the fight's gonna happen really at close range that the loop-to-loop -loop connection that I've tied here uh, doesn't get caught in the eyelet. So my rod tip might be right back in here. So having your leader short enough that this doesn't engage your rod tip is really quite handy. And this leader is just a little on the long side right there. So the way I build that leader is I'm using, um, I've got this, uh, this handy dandy uh, scientific anglers deal where I've got uh, 40, 60 and 80 pound test uh, inside here. And you can see that it feeds uh, the line out nice and neat. And so I just pull out a piece when I, when I need to pull out a piece, I pull it out and I tie a perfection loop in the end, loop to loop it on. And then down here, uh, tarpon don't like particularly large flies. Let's take a look at this dread pirate uh, that I'm fishing here. But I tie that on with a Homer Rhodes loop knot and then I close it with a double figure eight. And I think I have a video out there uh, on how to tie that, but you want a nice neat loop and that's the biggest loop I would ever want to tie. Typically, I'm going to tie my loops a little bit more compact uh, than that, but I'm just running one straight knotless fluorocarbon leader. These fish aren't going to take me to my backing. I'm not worried about losing a, a whole fly line and it's just a nice clean system uh, that's totally knotless. As far as flies go, flies are primarily going to be for, for tarpon in let's say the baby tarpon realm that might you know be tarpon up to about 30 pounds most of them are going to be 10 to 15 pounds and while that might not sound very big while you're sitting in your office or your easy chair right now when you're out here in this lagoon and you see a 15 pound tarpon cruising along the edge of the mangroves and it's this long it feels like the biggest fish on the planet it's pretty easy to get your stoke up you know uh, when you're actually out here uh, in the game so the flies aren't particularly large. Um, one little tip I have for you is there are certain days that they prefer certain flies and your guide is gonna have a lot of influence, of course, on what you use. But I like to keep a few different flies right here uh, on this patch. And I've got a suspended shrimp pattern right there, which makes a really nice um, overlap for snook. And then I've got uh, a home slice, a couple different variations of home slice. Then I got a couple of permit flies there. But uh, I think it's, it's very wise for an angler when it comes to fly selection to have a couple ready. And I can't encourage you enough before you go tarpon fishing to learn how to tie your own knots. You know, if it's time to change a fly and your guide's up on the polling deck asking your guide to stop looking for fish and stop pulling the boat so he can change your fly for you, it's, it's just ridiculous. Um, 
spend a little time in advance and learn how to tie that Homer Rhodes loop knot and keep your cutters handy so that if a fish flat out refuses your fly once or twice, you could just cut that, throw on another fly, 30 seconds later, you're back in there with a different fly pattern. Maybe, maybe it's a situation where you need a little bit more weight or it might be a situation where you need a very lightweight, delicate fly like this Dread Pirate here so that it lays down soft. The other thing I do is, um, kind of a pro tip here, I keep these uh, on a lanyard and I keep it under my shirt so that I can cut that. And I use scissor clamps uh, or cutters for this heavy 60 pound fluorocarbon. Cutting it with nippers is really hard because. All right, so we're out here tarpon fishing. You're now on the deck, you've got your gear in order, you, you've watched this video, you're prepared, you're out here, you're ready to do it. Uh, so first off, when you're on the deck uh, of, a, of a boat, whether it's a, a skiff like this or a panga, uh, first off, footwear, I wear boat shoes. Um, for me, that's the most comfortable. I, I've gone barefoot many times so I can feel the line and things, but I'm, I think I'm much more sturdy and athletic when I'm wearing boat shoes. And I think I said this in my permit 101 too, but don't wait until you're too old or, or you know, too old to go do this because the more athletic you're able to move around the boat, changing directions, keeping your balance, you're going to be more successful. Um, it really does help to, to do some calisthenics and, and get in shape for this type of fishing if you want to make the most of it. So you're up on the deck, you've got your, your, your appropriate footwear, you're ready to go. I've got my line peeled off. You want to make sure to keep your area clean so that your line, this is true of any boat fishing, keep your area clean. I've got my gear neatly piled on the other side of the cooler. I've, I've looked and I don't have anything my line can hang up on. The next thing I do is I'm going to pull out an appropriate amount of line. And for me, an appropriate amount of line is going to be depend a little bit on the wind and situation. In here, I don't need a lot of line. All the casting is going to be quite close. So more line equals more problems. I can cast a country mile, but the main thing is I want to be able to get there in like two false casts. So uh, maybe I'll even take a little bit more in. And then what I can do is I can look at the color changes on my line and I know each time I jump up about where I need to be. So I've got the green to yellow color change just barely out my rod. So I've got the amount of line that I feel like I can comfortably handle. And now I'm gonna be in the ready position on the deck. The ready position for me is I want basically a rod length of the fly line out. So I'm measuring that out right now. So that's nine feet of fly line out my rod tip. And then I'm gonna hold my leader halfway up like so. I'm gonna leave my fly lay on the deck. And now I'm ready for the guy to spot the fish. I'm ready to cast, I'm ready to make my move, okay? So when, I, when a fish is spotted, the guide is typically gonna say 12 o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, and so on and so forth. So you're gonna communicate with your guide and the clock is typically gonna be off the boat's posture not off your posture. So the guy is not gonna look to see which way you're facing and then say 12 o'clock from your position. He's looking at the fish, okay? This is 12 o'clock. So the guide says two o'clock. And I think this is one of the more important bits of communication. As soon as the guide says two o'clock, which is gonna be over here, as a right-hander, I already know that I'm gonna have to backhand cast, okay? because he's up on the polling deck. He's got a 27 foot carbon fiber push pole sticking up like so. He's on the deck. And if I go to cast as a right-hander, I'm way too likely to snag him, snag my fishing partner, hit the pole, hit the casting deck. It's gonna be a train wreck. Trust me, I've been there. So if the, if the call is two o'clock, you know, 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet, and so on, I know immediately that I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna look over and I'm gonna try to see the fish first. Okay, that's very critical, but I'm gonna go, I'm gonna backhand, just like that. And if it's on that side of the boat, that's one of the biggest mistakes I see people make is trying to cast on their strong side on a two to three o'clock, one, two or three o'clock shot. And they snag the polling deck. Now the flies out them, the fish are getting away. It turns into just a, just a total go rodeo. So that's one tip I have for you. As far as casting just big saltwater rods and big gear and heavy things, get that snag free real quick as far as casting and here's a tip for you don't get the guides boat dirty they don't like that very much as far as casting heavy rods goes we want to make sure that we're always keeping that line tight 
And you're going to notice when I cast a 10 or a 12 weight rod, they can be very pleasant to cast. Any more a 10 weight, even this NRX, feels just like a, a toothpick. Um, and a lot of it is just about having constant pressure on the fly in the rod. I never let that rod come completely unloaded. I've always got connectivity with my fly, and I'd say that's just, this video is more about tarpon, but that's the simplest tip I can give you about that. The next casting tip I'm gonna give you is gonna be one that we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna film a little slow motion video of here in just a moment. So let's go ahead and cut, and then I'll show you this next tip, which is gonna be learning to throw a tailing loop and bring that fly in very low, almost skipping across the water so that we can deliver it up under the mangrove edges without snagging in the canopy. Go ahead and cut it. Okay, so in that little slow motion clip, what you saw was my, my rod stayed up really high and I actually took my rod and I brought it forward and dipped the tip just a little bit and then I kept it up at the end. And what that causes your fly to do is your fly will actually follow the or parallel the path the rod tip, but I can bring that fly in very low and very soft so that fly can actually shoot out with some speed and go out and then just drop very gently. It's one of the greatest saltwater casts that you can learn and you can practice it right there in your own backyard or, or around the lake. I do it with grasshoppers back home for trout as well. Uh, another tip with casting is gonna be the fish, the fish's position. We're gonna start talking a little bit about strategy. And these tarpon can be extremely spooky. Uh, man, I blew a couple shots earlier today. I was so mad at myself. I just got way too aggressive. I put the fly way too close to the fish. This water is very clear here. And uh, these, these fish typically are living right in against the mangroves. They're a nervous fish by nature when they're in here. And I was way too aggressive. And uh, what you really need to do is you need to really determine that fish's path of travel. And so, you know, communicating with your guide, not getting too worked up and too excited. You can look at it and go, okay, where's the fish? Tarpon typically aren't fast movers in here. They, they float along very slowly. And you wanna get that fly hopefully 10 or 15 feet out in front of them if you get that opportunity. So we plant the fly, we wanna let that fly sink very slowly. And then as the tarpon approaches, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna have our rod down. In fact, I'm just gonna do this right here. Uh, right here, right now, we'll just talk. So uh, let's just say I've got a group of fish coming here. I'm gonna make my cast and I'm looking at the fish and the guide says, good. Now you'll notice I'm already into my strip, okay? So the second that flies down, I'm into my strip and I'm bringing my rod tip down to the water so I have good direct connectivity. Do not have your rod up like this. You can't afford to have that slack and that line hop in there. That's a terrible habit. Okay, get that rod down, come into your strip. Draw your slack tight, okay? The other thing that's gonna happen is we're gonna wait on that fish, hopefully. We're gonna wait on that fish and just let our fly flutter for just a moment. My first strip is gonna be slow like that. It's gonna be a relatively long strip. It's gonna bring my fly up, hopefully get the fish's attention. After that, I'm gonna to go to one foot medium pace strips. As the fish begins pursuing, I need to get excited and pick my tempo up a little bit. If you think you're gonna stop stripping and give that fish a chance to catch it, you're gonna regret it. That fish will generally stop immediately. Prey is scared. It swims faster as the fish gets closer. Go ahead and keep stripping. And then the strike, oh my, do not trout set, okay? Keep your rod tip down, stay cool, don't freak out. That fish is gonna come up and tarpon are designed with their mouths to attack from underneath. They'll eat right on the surface. The tarpon in here are oftentimes gonna make a big boil like a dry fly when they eat your fly. It's gonna be very exciting. You're probably gonna wanna try to trout set, but what we wanna do is we wanna keep that rod tip down. The hook set is just so critical. There's two parts that are critical. One, staying cool, keeping that rod down, staying home, not lifting the rod tip. If you lift the rod tip, you're not gonna get hook penetration. You're gonna lose every single one of them. Trust me, I, I tried for years, just out of instinct. Lifting my rod tip doesn't work. Uh, so what we wanna do is, there's two things that are critical. Don't trout set. The other one is we need to have a lot of force behind that hook set. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and 
and snag my fly in the mangrove here. I'm gonna try. It never usually snags when I want it to. Okay. So what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna set up. Let's just say we feel like a strike is imminent. This is so important. Okay, so I made a good cast, I'm ready. One of the first things I want to, to, to tell you is a good angler is gonna be in a very athletic position. Don't be standing up here, leaning back like you're bass fishing back home in Alabama, okay? So you wanna be forward, okay, with your weight. I like to go with my right foot forward typically, and I'm gonna have my hands forward like this, okay? The hands forward is very important, and you have gotta remind yourself of this, okay? So I'm stripping, I'm stripping, and let's just say I have a strike. I either see it or just feel it. Sometimes you'll just feel it if it's a little bit deeper or dark water, but I've engaged the fish, okay? Now the hook set doesn't really happen with your line hand. You don't have enough power there to bury that hook. A tarpon's mouth is essentially pure bone. So I'm setting the hook with my left, or I'm finding the fish with my left hand, and I'm just initiating the set. I'm just trying to get that hook to grab hold. After I've, I've hit them and found the fish with my left hand, I'm gonna go ahead and bring that rod right into my stomach like so. You may need to bring it all the way back, but it works pretty good to bring it into your stomach because once you've done that, it's very hard to raise your rod tip. It's very awkward, okay? So we need to stay real tight to our body like this. Keep your hand down low. Don't get your hand up here. We need to strike back like this with our elbow real tight to our body. And then at that point, I can take another strip. Then I can step back because I was on the front of the bow and I can lean up because I had a low athletic stance, but I want to keep my rod at a very low angle as I do that. Chances are that fish is going to jump like crazy right off the bat. You've really got one really good opportunity to set that hook when that fish is relatively stationary and we can just dig into that fish like so. You really need to have a lot of force behind the hook set and you can't do it alone with your left hand like that. Once we've got that fish hooked, we wanna make sure we keep our rod down. We're gonna to try to keep that fish in the water with a very low angle. The low angle has two meanings. I want my rod down near the water. I also want my rod oriented toward the fish so that I'm using the butt of my rod to, to keep that hook firmly dug in. When the, when the tarpon jumps, that's usually when they come off, they jump up, they, they shake their head like crazy. I like to have my rod down low when that happens because the line begins to bounce and oscillate all over the place. That hook just shakes out. But I want to give that fish a little softer tension. You could say, you know, there's a saying, bow to the king. You know, the tarpon being the silver king. When I'm, when I'm fighting that fish and that thing jumps, I just want to soften up a little bit, just like that, because it's going to find every possible angle to try to get that hook out. And I lower it down like that. And then when we're fighting the tarpon, we want to keep that rod down. And if I'm the tarpon right here and the hook is here, you want to pull that line back against along its body to keep that fish pinned up right there. So there are a lot more tips and strategies. This is a lifelong adventure, but hopefully this kind of this one-on-one -on -one rundown I've taught you today uh, helps you get started and be successful and make the most out of the, the, the investment and the time that you put into to going on a tarpon fishing adventure.